Hello again, and welcome back to Parenting Stuff I Wish I Knew Sooner and I Want You to Know Now. I'm your host, Erica Desper, founder of the Center for Confident Parenting and a mom who has seemed to learn everything I needed to know the hard way. My guest today, I'm super excited, is Dr. Maria Cordero. She is mom to two young children, ages four and eight, a board-certified pediatric dentist and the owner of Philadelphia Pediatric Dentistry. Just as a side note, she's also a biomedical engineer. <laughs> So that's fun. Dr. Maria, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, Erica. I, as you know, love talking to you. Could go on for hours. <laughs> I was just kicking myself for not recording our prep session because we were cracking up and it was super fun. And we'll have to come back and do a, a fun podcast later. Um, <laughs> while we're on the topic, remind me, biomedical engineer, like what, what what's going on with that? I feel like I'm in the presence of greatness and I'm suddenly intimidated. Well, I think a, a little bit of it is it's my parents' version of wishing they could have learned it the easy way, but learning the hard way, guiding me through how my brain worked. Mm -hmm. um, and a little bit of there are so many ways to solve a problem. And you can sometimes look at a problem and go, I think this is how a system works. Or you could look at a problem and say, I believe this is how it works. Let's build a model and test it. Mm -hmm. And that's how my brain works. Mm -hmm. And that's all that biomedical engineering really is. It's looking at something beautiful like the body, biology, and saying, I think I understand this mechanism. Let's pull it away from that and let's be able to put it in a lab and do something with it. So you can model how blood flows through your body the way an electrical circuit works and then mm -hmm. you can make decisions on that so it was a great decision I am not a PhD in biomedical engineering doing drug research as I thought I was going to be <laughs> I am a pediatric dentist and I study how the brains of small humans and their parents come together and make decisions um, and you model it in a very similar way so it's it's actually a delightful part of my practice every day. So, that is that is so very cool. Unless I didn't know it, um, you're the first, you know, biomedical engineer I've ever <laughs> ever spoken with, and definitely the first one I've had on the show. So <laughs> awesome, love but it. That is not why we're here today. So first things first, tell us some other things about yourself, your family, and of course how your uh, pediatric dental practice came to be. Thank you. Yes. So when I talk about my my practice, I always open up with the the silly joke of I'm a recovering academic. So that biomedical engineering, that didn't stop. That didn't stop when I went to dental school. I went on and as soon as I came out of residency, I was like, I want to do so much more than I can with my two hands. So I went straight into teaching in dental schools and residency programs and surrounded myself with people far wiser than my new grad self and stepped into roles that I don't know how I convinced them to, to trust me, to, but I had to learn so much. And make it until you make it. <laughs> exactly. And I also was able to develop ideas in a space where you could just incubate something, where you didn't have to be producing and a business. You could mm. say, I believe this is how it should work. And I understand it hasn't always been that way, but we could do better. And that special incubation of the ivory tower that people talk about and say, oh, well, it only works there. Um, and it's a space that helped me develop a lot of my understanding of nutrition because traditionally you get a whole two hours of that training, right? But I, I'm very passionate about nutrition. It's Ooh, a space that gave me <laughs> a lot of development in behavior um, and not just child behavior because people love to st study child behavior, but caregiver behavior, behavioral change, how we take on our decisions. Um, it's a space that allowed me to work with other specialists all the time. So I didn't have to limit myself to the knowledge base available to pediatric dentistry. I had endodontists down the hall and I was able to, to learn as they kept updating their techniques and methods and materials. I have, I was in a department consistently with orthodontists. So I could constantly say, I understand you, you start and do it this way, but what are you seeing now? And I could widen what I saw. So it was just a beautiful first decade. And so that first decade, 
ran straight into the next biggest thing in my life, which was I, I became a parent. Oh man, that changed everything. That changed absolutely everything. Um, and part of what it changed was how I could spend the 24 hours of a day. Mm-hmm. And what I realized was as I was coming through this academic world, in order to meet my goals and my dreams, I had to become a dean. Mm-hmm. And that's a lot of hours. And there are other ways to be able to have that much contribution. And so that's where I started framing out that I might actually own a practice, open up a practice, because I had a child that I was very committed to walking to school every day. Mm-hmm. And it's such a little thing, but the the threat to my ability to walk my child to school every day was incredibly motivating. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also had a child that taught me what gray meant. Because mm. I was the best parent ever before I had a child. Before you had a child. Aren't right? all? Like, oh my goodness, what I didn't know. But also how much empathy did to the practice that that I'm able to offer families. Because like, it's very academic to say, like, you need to do a better job with your kids' teeth. Right. It's it, super it academic to, to say you must stop sucking your thumb. Otherwise you're going to ruin everything. Right. Right. But with no <laughs> awareness of like the logistics what? of implementing that can be right. really difficult, if not impossible slash overwhelming in like real life. And what so, probably so just happened before. Both pieces, right? Yes. That's awesome. So much empathy and patience, not just for the child, but for families, because mm-hmm. Each touch point is an opportunity to share like, okay, where do we need to grow? And I don't have to win, right? Mm -hmm. I just have to keep showing up and help them get incrementally closer to where they want to be. Mm -hmm. And typically it's also where I hope they should be. That doesn't have to always be the same thing. So I just think that my son has taught me tremendous things that I never would have known in that first decade of very academic pediatric dentistry. Which is amazing because look at your (laughs) academic background and here comes this little tiny human like, oh yeah? (laughs) Watch me. do something. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. And then you add to it, I'm I'm the parent of two now. I have Mm -hmm. a daughter. My daughter taught me that just because you think you are the expert because you have a child, you don't know Mm -hmm. Um, And so she's a perfect example where I said, okay, this, this, this was hard. Ducks in a row. I've got it round two. And it just wasn't. And then she arrived different, different person than you expected, probably. (laughs) Different person. And I I just got scrambled across the board. Also, it was COVID, which was a really weird Mm -hmm. time to have a a baby. Um, and, And I thought that that was really fantastic, too. And I have changed the type of practice that I have tremendously as a result of those experiences with my daughter and the people that I met along the way and that I learned so much from. Um, And so you can see a good amount of how I share with parents, how I come up with care plans with families, what I educate myself in, where I put all of my energy has a lot to do with those, those two parenting steps, looking for what I needed so that when someone comes to me, I have more than what I had. Oh, that's so beautiful. I love it. We could essentially say it's a family business, right? It is. <laughs> I guess that's something to also know. I'm second generation, fully immersed dentist. So my oh, father's okay. a dentist and I grew up in a home dental office. So there is also that nature um, mm-hmm. where many times you have people who have a dental office that's always a couple towns over from where they live. My office is half a mile walk from my house. I am the opposite of the person who wants to be separate from it. I want to see all of my patients when I drop my son off at school. I love it. I love the the recognition, that community feel, being part of it, being intrinsic to it, um, as opposed to needing to clearly separate, this is my work and this is where my safe space is. Now, I have been seen taking my garbage out in pajama pants and no makeup on. You didn't and quite want to take it, the community outreach that far. <laughs> I mean, it is what it is. This is who I am. You just have to be okay with that. And I am okay with that. Well, but the rest of the almost, time I do my hair. Right. It almost harkens back to, you know, 
the olden days, whatever we want to call them, when like you did have a little community and someone was the store owner and someone was the dentist and, you know, you yes. all cross paths throughout your days. It's, it's really super cool. I think that's one of the cool things about you're obviously in the art museum um, area of Philadelphia. Um, there are still spots that, you know, sort of function that way. And I think that's, that's one of them. Um, so while that's a great segue, while you're talking about your mission to really like be part of the community and not separate it. I know one of the things that you're super passionate about is community outreach. Yes. Specifically with respect to nutrition and ensuring that every child, every family has access to healthy food. So can you tell us a little bit about your partnership with the Food Trust? Yes, absolutely. I I love that partnership. Actually, it was one of the things when you're coming out of academia and you're like, I know what my community service is. I know how I'm contributing to my neighborhood and my city every single day. And you go into a small office where you're just one one dentist. I'm one small person. Um, and they gave me an opportunity to still help more. And so what the Food Trust does, they have a strong mission of seeking food security. Mm -hmm. um, and so the idea is that not everybody has access to healthy, delicious food, fresh food, um, the, the varieties that they need. Not everybody knows where food comes from. Not everybody knows which choices are actually the better choices for them. And not everybody has the transportation available or the financial resources available. And when I speak every day to a family and I say, you know, there are sometimes choices and then mm -hmm. the choices that I want you to make more often, right? Not forbidden foods, but not everybody gets a choice. And so mm -hmm. for me, being able to work with the Food Trust every quarter, we pick a project that helps children in the greater Philadelphia area have those choices. And so... It might be like in the fall, we do this wonderful program where we buy lots, like tons of apples, like literally tons. And we go into the school and we have like a seasonally appropriate farming book that we'll read with the kids. The last time we actually sponsored an author who had written a book about black eyed peas. So it's awesome. culturally relevant food, mm -hmm. farming, hand in the dirt experiences. And these kids got to read the stories. They got to take this bag of apples home to their families. And it's, we're picking communities that need these things that maybe haven't seen a farm. They don't get to go strawberry picking. Like I try right. to go. And if that sounds and, crazy to you, like, cool. Like, you know, some of us are quite privileged. So let's just, <laughs> let's right. just, let's honor that. If you're hearing this and like, seriously, really a bag of yeah. apples. Um, but like, you know, we need to check ourselves and realize that some of us are very fortunate and some of us are yeah. not. And some people's experiences and, and resources are super, super limited. One of the cool, so talking about behavior, caregiver behavior, they approached me last year and they said, we would like to supplement SNAP benefits mm -hmm. so that a family could get as much fresh produce from a farm market as they would get packaged goods with those same benefits at a corner store. Mm -hmm. So we want to see that if we just supplemented enough, can we change their purchasing behavior to take better care of themselves? Mm -hmm. I was like, yep, I am here for that. Please right? let me do that. So we've done that, that at <laughs> farmer's markets. We've brought farmer's markets to schools. So what they'll do is the kids will staff the farmer's market. So they're learning about commerce. Um, they will bring a farmer so that the kids actually are, are meeting somebody that is, is farming directly and gets to talk about it. And so they'll do like school assembly stuff. Um, and then also it supplements so that farmer can regularly come and offer that food to these families that don't otherwise have access. So it needs cushion to become sustainable. And I get to be the cushion. I, okay. And and so it sets up infrastructure so it lasts. And then we get to build gardens once a year. Um, that's like, that's always my favorite project when they're like, all right, we have a school that wants to build a green space. Can you sponsor that? I'm like, yes, please. Please, yeah. let's do that. I love it. Well, I will try to link to that in the show notes as well. It's a very beautiful mission. Um, so you and I have obviously met before. Um, we did a video and we were talking just the basics of early oral health. We're not yes. going to dig too much into that today because I want to talk about something different, but I will try to link to that video as well in case you're wondering a lot about what to do with your baby or toddler. Um, but another thing you are quite passionate about, I don't think you do anything not passionately. Is that No, fair? not okay. worth showing up for. <laughs> Uh, me too. Hey, 
uh, is supporting oral health in infancy, which includes the airway. So yes. this is something that may or may not, probably not, be on a lot of parents' radar. It's a my radar just because working with kids who are having trouble sleeping, one of the things I like to sort of watch for red flags for is if they, if anything is affecting their airway. Um, mm -hmm. So let's, you know, let's dig into that. Um, yes, I'd love to. Before we do that, just touch on briefly, like when should parents begin to care for teeth? And yeah. you, might, you might modify that. And when do we start taking kids to the dentist? And then we'll get Great. to the airway stuff. Yes. Okay. So one of the most important things to know is as soon as they have teeth in their mouth, everything changes. Your bacteria changes and you have to take care of them. Um, and so the bacteria that causes cavities doesn't even show up until there is a tooth. Mm -hmm. So the answer to when do you have to take care of teeth is as soon as it happens. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we're surprised though. So what I would suggest is people always talk about, oh, you have to clean the gums. You don't really have to clean the gums, but you should, from the point your baby is born, wash your hands and put your finger in your baby's mm -hmm. mouth every day. And it seems like you're just like checking off and doing a thing, but you are doing so many things. You are waking up nerve endings, activating mm -hmm. the tongue and familiarizing yourself with what normal is. And you will never miss when that first tooth comes in. Mm -hmm. And what I really like about this is we've all had babies who get sick. And then three days later, after being a little congested, they get their ear infection. <sighs> It is a little bit frustrating to go in when you think it's an ear infection and it's just an erupting tooth. This <laughs> yeah. will prevent you ever going to the pediatrician being like, my kiddo has a fever. They're kind of grumpy. I think they have an ear infection. And then the pediatrician goes, oh, look, they're teething. Which, by the way, I totally did. did of course. Right? This is a perfect example of, um, please, please learn. It was just absolutely mortifying and hilarious at the same time. Not where saying I was you like, shouldn't go if you're concerned, but like if you can just see and feel and be like, oh, yeah. that's what it is. It is yeah, so empowering to know when something changes. So taking yeah. care of your little one's mouth begins by just like knowing it. And so mm -hmm. touching it, fear not, be there, be empowered by it. And as soon as they have a tooth, you start brushing it with a brush that has gentle bristles. Mm -hmm. And then I usually, when you come in office, I ask mom and dad, what kind of toothpaste do you use? People make conscientious decisions for themselves. And if they're like, we don't use Crest, we use Colgate, they're using a fluoride toothpaste. And I say, well, I think littles should do what their grownups do. Mm -hmm. And so if you use Crest or Colgate, you should use a grain of rice of that same toothpaste or a kid flavored version, but it should have fluoride in it. Mm -hmm. but a smaller amount of that medicine, a grain mm -hmm. of rice. And you should brush your little one's teeth before bed at the very least. And then we'll start coaching up to twice a day when they're ready. Right. And I presume like you mentioned on the parent side, get to know your child's mouth. Uh, I presume that's also getting the baby ready of like, Hey, at some point we'll be yeah. in here and we'll be doing stuff and it won't be like this big thing that we have to get used to. Exactly. Because if you take your finger in and rub it over your baby's gums once a day and you make eye contact, you are meaningfully interacting with your baby. It is purposeful play and they're going to look forward to it. If you spend the entire first year of their life avoiding their oral cavity, unless they're choking on something, they're suddenly going to be like, what are you doing in here? It's a different association. Yeah. It's totally for different. Sure, for sure. So it just, it helps both parties feel really good about it. Okay. Awesome. Um, all right. So we talked about, oh, and did, and did you say like, when are we doing this first dentist? Oh yes. Ho okay. Hopefully when are we doing this? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So a first dental visit should occur between the first tooth and the first birthday. And that first tooth typically shows up around six months. And I say around six months because the bell curve is kind of wide. Like my children didn't get their first teeth until they were like 10 and 11 months old. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with a very late bloomer with teeth. It's actually kind of helpful. It's just, they're not going to bite you if you're nursing. <laughs> I've, I've, like, I've been there. <laughs> right? Um, and so it's one of those things. I, I tell you the six months, but I want you to know, please do not worry if that's just not the textbook your baby read. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so between first tooth and first birthday means that I can sit down and spend 30 minutes with you and we can talk about 
how to brush baby's teeth with what you may choose, what modifications to diet you're going to be looking forward to in the next three months, six months, nine months. I might check in on how intro to solids is going and what techniques and, and philosophies you chose for your baby and how to make them work better for you. I'm going to chat with you about milk transitions. This might be a transition from formula to cow's milk. It might be a transition from um, daytime nursing to cow's milk and continued other nursing times. It might be a conversation. I'm a big supporter of extended nursing. and I want to make sure that families are empowered to do so without compromising any dental health. Mm -hmm. um, so we cover a lot during that yeah, appointment. Yeah, and that, I think that's just another thing that sets you, maybe some others, apart. That's the whole the education piece, the taking the time, the, it's just, I mean, we've all been to the dentist. It doesn't usually go that way. <laughs> No, and, and if you do a really good job the first time, it's not always going to be very lengthy because a two and a half year old for a 30 minute visit, that's stressful for families. Yeah. I want to do it while they're still like happy to sit on mom's lap and we can sit and chat and just like set up great groundwork. But the other thing that I really hope to offer my families is I know pediatricians have to cover so much during all of those well visits. Yeah. And I am hoping to offer them the support that if they had something touched on and had more questions or they needed someone to spend more time on it, I can be that space. I can be that support. It's so beautiful. All right. So that's as much touching on just like general oral care that we're going to do today. So okay. let's, let's get to the issues, right? That was all pretty positive. Um, what, what issues do parents need to have on their radar? And what are the red flags that would signal, like, maybe we need someone to explore this? Yeah. Um, I guess how young, do you want to go into like newborn? Do you uh, want to go, go that it. low? Yeah, let's go that low. Yeah, let's go. Okay. <laughs> so there is a good part of my practice, which is supporting um, that newborn parent dyad where feeding is mm -hmm. really their biggest concern. There's no teeth typically in a newborn. Um, and so, you know, 10 years ago, that might have been almost exclusively someone trying to breastfeed and the latch is poor and they look under the tongue and they find a tongue tie. And so like, that's, that's where it really originated from. Right. Um, my practice is looking at it, man, hand in hand with so many brilliant therapists. And I've learned a lot in this space, but it is still fundamentally support for anatomy. So sometimes anatomy isn't letting us do what we are meant to do. And that is we, we're supposed to feed. We might feed on a breast, we might feed on a bottle, but we should be able to do so efficiently, comfortably without tremendous gulps of air and gas that makes the belly hurt or the milk come right back up. Um, and so I spend a lot of time with those little babies and families that are navigating that. Um, so things to look for that I would not expect to look for. Like, I think everybody knows breastfeeding is a hard thing, right? And I Even think if that there's the, nothing going on with the anatomy. <laughs> breastfeeding is hard. It's totally hard. Um, and I think that, you know, most people notice tongue ties can sometimes contribute to it. And and I think that it's seen in hospitals. I don't see a lot of babies coming into my practice that are tongue tied all the way to the tip of their tongue, can't stick their tongues out of their mouth. I think the, the hospitals are doing a much better job of screening these things. And right. our pediatricians are noticing that and helping those babies access the help they need. Um, and so I'm going to mention the ones that trickle through. That, mm -hmm. that are interesting to me and are yeah. often missed. So babies that I see that are often missed, um, a good example is, and, and breastfeeding is hard, we will see a good number of babies at the three-week-old mark. And this baby parent combo, the mom will describe often, this baby is never satisfied. They are starving. They're always hungry. And so during a visit, they will sit and they might actually nurse them once or twice just over the course of my consult, which is only 30 minutes. Um, which when I say only 30 minutes, that's actually a really long consult. Right. Um, <laughs> but, but it's like, pretty close together to have eaten twice. <laughs> right. And so you'll see them 
and you'll see a baby that loves to nurse, that snuggles into mom, is happy, is, is, is coming close and is opening their mouth, but it's like they're sipping. Mm. And so you will hear gulps of air sometimes, but you might just see them just like opening their mouth, leaning in and then sitting back up or falling asleep on the breast. Mm. And these are babies that are not transferring. Mm -hmm. And mom is a very lucky person because she's an oversupply mom. Right. I always tell them, like, if you were in prehistoric times, you would have made it and I would not because I was a low supply mom. Right. You're a high supply mom. And it's such a wonderful blessing because as long as there's milk, it's a little bit easier for you. Like you can right. make this work. It's just going to need a little bit of attention. And then you look at this baby and what you realize was they were not latched. They mm. opened their mouth and received what was available. And that strong letdown is really what's keeping them going. And this mom who was very willing to accept that breastfeeding is hard. And mm. so it didn't occur to them that they weren't supposed to do it every 30 minutes or right. every hour. No, um, and there's that whole I, the concept of like, you know, nurse on demand or on cue or however you want right. to phrase that. So you can take that to an extreme of like, okay, well, my baby wants it every 30 minutes. Right. And so, and we're... Uh, <laughs> we're just told it's so hard and, and we want to do hard things for our babies. We don't want to think that we're putting ourselves first. And so I see people just try really, really hard and not realize those, those things. So that's over time, you know, there's cluster feeding times when that's actually normal, yeah. um, but it's not normal all the time. And then you'll get a weight check where baby doesn't follow their own growth curve. That's a, that's a good example of who I see pretty often. Right. And when we go in and I do a full body exam, so I lay the baby down between me and the parents and I take their, their head in my hands and I'm going to feel the shape of their head because I am looking for a baby who might have some flattening starting because mm -hmm. they're habitually going to one side. And then I'm going to give them a little neck massage and I'm going to feel how the muscles of the neck and the back feel. And mm -hmm. sometimes I feel one-sided tension. Sometimes their necks feel like my neck and a dentist's neck is a bad neck because we're always like this and really <laughs> tense, you know. But babies should not feel like that. Um, but sometimes they do. And I'm gonna run my hands down their sides and just look at how their hips turn. And sometimes what I notice is that there are asymmetries. Mm -hmm. And this is good screening, not diagnosis. This is not my scope of practice. Right. Really, right? Like right here, this is right. my scope of practice. <laughs> um, but it is good to be able to notice when asymmetries exist and help connect people to those that can help them with it. Then I work my way in and I go around in the mouth and I'm feeling for tension in the cheeks, the shape of the upper arch and the shape of the upper arch really varies among babies. Um, sometimes I call it a vaulted cathedral ceiling. Sometimes it feels like a little bubble where you could hide your finger up there. And sometimes it's broad and you're like, yeah, this is the way it's supposed to be. And you'll feel muscle tension because depending on the muscles that are working, the ones working get big. And for all babies feeding, the muscle that's supposed to be working is the tongue. Mm. And so the tongue should be big. And babies who can't use their tongue for some reason, the cheeks get big, the mm. lips get big, um, because that's all that's left. You, you must feed somehow. So you feed around, you feel around and you learn like, all right, well, how is this baby functioning? How are they compensating? How are they, they making all of this work? Um, and then you go in and you lift up the tongue. And these are the babies that I typically see. And it looks like the Eiffel Tower under there, right? It's not all the way to the tip of the tongue, but when you lift it up such that it should suction to the roof of the mouth, you look at it and you're like, oof, it's pulling tightly on that lower gum. And the family inevitably tells me, Nobody told me they had a tongue tie. And I go, but did anybody put their fingers in? And right. they'll go, no. And I'm like, well. They peeked with their eyes. Yeah. And that's yeah. fine. If that's, you know, you, you, you don't want to just say based on, oh, you're struggling. Your baby has a tongue tie. Because I would never say that. Right. Um, but you do want to put two fingers in and peek. And so there's no reason everybody who has a baby shouldn't feel comfortable going ahead and yeah. checking that out. But you also have something to compare, have to have something like experience to compare it to. Like, this yep. doesn't feel like the other ones I've felt. And therefore, exactly. whereas like, even if I stick my hands in my kid's mouth, yep. I don't know what I'm feeling. Oh before, yeah. Yes, right? yes. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. but the idea is like sticking your fingers in gives you the ability. Right. Yeah. And if you don't, you can't really look for all of 
the mm-hmm. the types of ties that are there. Yeah. So I always I always land there. And then, you know, I show the parent that I'm not going to pull right out of the mouth and I put my finger up on the roof of the mouth and show the baby sucking just like they might on a, a nipple or a pacifier to soothe them down and mm-hmm. hand them back and say, sorry, I know Dr. Maria is super annoying. And we, we get the baby to settle right back down and they always settle <laughs> right back down. That's a really good right flag example, yeah. riding the letdown. Um, another let, good... me, let me interrupt you for one second because I I never know what people know and what people don't know. Um, one thing I wanted to go back to is that the mechanics of feeding, whether yes. it's breast or bottle, but even particularly breast, are so complicated that if you oh my haven't goodness, really they are. studied that or seen it on seeing how the milk transfers and what's involved with the transfer and like, you know, radiography or whatever. Um, it really is like, when you see it, you're like, wow, I'm surprised it ever works at all because there's right? so, many, <laughs> so many moving parts. This extremely um, complex we, motion of the yeah. tongue. And all tongue we think of is like, and the seal and then it like dances. <laughs> It does this, yes, this like undulating dance thing. Um, but it's not just like you might think, oh, it's their lips or whatever. But yeah, it's the lips, it's the tongue, it's the cheeks. It's and so I, I think you can correct me if I'm wrong. The reason that a lot of um, tethered tissue or, as they're sometimes called, or ties do get missed is probably the not feeling inside. But also, it isn't always obvious in the front or to the eye because, right? There can be most people are checking for the tongue ties in the front, but it can be all the way in the back. It can be the yep. cheeks. It can be the lips. Um, Absolutely. So there's just a lot more to it. Um, and my favorite example is, and sometimes it's not the tongue at all. And it could be the palate. Which uh, it can be the palate right. or it can be all that stuff that I checked first. And, mm-hmm. you know, a tongue tie is something that you treat, I treat surgically, right? Mm-hmm. But sometimes our muscles are so tight that the next muscle downstream can't move to its full motion. And so sometimes it's not a tongue tie at all. Sometimes it's just all these muscles were so tight, they were pulling, 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 and Which the tongue was fine. Which could be from gestation and delivery. Yes. That very natural thing that we're all talking about. Oh, birth is natural. Yes, but it's difficult still. And it's hard on the body. <laughs> Right. It's hard on my body. It was hard on baby to be folded in half like a football in there until they got out. Um, So, so absolutely helpful for parents too. This does not always require a surgical intervention. I don't do want to come back to varying opinions on that later, but um, it could be something as simple as uh, what chiropractor, craniopathy, PT. Well, okay. This is a good example where I want to jump into a science statement. So when looking at mommy baby dyads, there is an article out there, I think it came out of Boston, where over 60% of the babies, if they were given better feeding therapy assistance, did not need a procedure. Mm -hmm. Right? And I think that that's the important thing to come from, where many times you might identify anatomy that looks suspicious or looks like it's causing the problem, but help can often make it that that is not the case. And so that help, I usually recommend start with an IBCLC. Start with somebody who really understands the function of lactation, can help mom with milk supply and baby with latch. And you will see a good percentage of those babies that were suspected of tongue tie actually thrive. And do really, really well. And, and I would stress that many IBCLCs will also support parents who haven't chosen to breastfeed or wanted oh, to yes. and, and aren't right now or do yes. some sort of combo. Now, you do have to find one that, that fits and fits the situation, yeah. but but they would be the sort of frontline person to look at all of this regardless of how you're feeding. Oh, yeah. Feed. So that would, I'll, and we'll come back to it, but that would be my second red flag baby. There's that, that mm-hmm. bottle fed baby struggling and mm-hmm. IBCLCs mm-hmm. are amazing, mm-hmm. amazing support for that. Um, or infant, you know, speech therapists might be my second one for there. Um, yeah, this is good. Man, I get on tangents for this. So know, like, okay. We, so we, a, we a percentage totally need just better help better assistance. And then another percentage you look at and you're like, the anatomy doesn't seem to be the culprit. It seems to be the victim. Um, Mm -hmm. An example of that is when I have full mobility of the tongue, but the cheeks are overactive and the lip always curls in when a baby is nursing. And you're like, it's all muscle. This is muscle pulling these things. And if we could just help these muscles calm down and get the right one coordinated to what it's supposed to do, 
you can see that change. Um, and that takes somebody skilled putting hands in the mouth and systematically teaching the family how to teach the baby to suck. And I know that we are supposed to be born able to do these things, but sometimes we need help. Actually, most of the babies I see need help, but I only see babies struggling, right? So I have a subset. We say that right. too, yeah. <laughs> we don't meet the but babies like, who are doing fine. <laughs> no, no, they're just, they're sleeping and, and everybody's happy and they're planning a yeah. second child. Um, okay. So it's, it, there's so many times that they just don't need surgery. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I did last month, because there was a big conversation about that, was looked at my numbers. And so yeah. I looked at a quarter of data and I had done over 200 consults. I'd seen a lot of babies. Correct. And I only completed treatment on 35% of them. Okay. And there's so many reasons. So some of them were they just needed additional help. Some of them were they were data seeking. They wanted mm -hmm. to know, could this be contributing? And that's something that I think is really important, that there are many ways to feed a baby. Mm -hmm. And I'm very supportive of you just feeding your baby to your own personal goals. And you mm -hmm. can ask me, is there a tie? Is there a functional? And I'm sure that I have many solutions for you on what you might need. And then yeah. some babies did need a procedure. Sure. And, and I feel really good about those numbers. I think my numbers are much lower, mm -hmm. maybe, than most providers, because my goal is to be part of your team, as opposed right. to being your release provider. Well, and let me jump in there. So when I am sort of figuring this out as we go, so everyone join me for the ride, uh, yes. doing the sleep stuff that I do, I do get a lot of, you know, new parents with very young babies and they're trying to figure out, is this a sleep problem? Is this a feeding problem? You know, is it colic? What is it? Um, and I get very skeptical when they say, we saw someone and they said, there's no tie, or we saw someone and they said, there is a tie, but it doesn't need to be result. It's not, you know, the main factor. What I hear you saying is that may be true and maybe I should be less skeptical, but what I'm thinking I would change my language to is like, okay, and there still may be other interventions that are needed other than revising it and other support that you have in place so that they can still do whatever they're trying, you know, the feeding, the sleeping, whatever the challenge yeah. is. Like, I don't know if it's enough to say like, no, there isn't one or no, there is, there is one and it doesn't need to be revised. It's like, and what's the and, right? Yeah. But not everyone is as informed as you. So they're not going to, maybe the provider doesn't suggest anything else. Well, I think also I am very hesitant to recommend a treatment if I don't think the outcome is going to be measurable improvement. Mm -hmm. Right. So a good example, I will not recommend a phrenectomy if the baby is not therapeutically prepared, mm -hmm. if they haven't done some suck training, mm -hmm. because I know that if I release that tongue, but the baby isn't already trying to stick their tongue out, trying to suction the tongue up, it's really hard to learn new skills when something hurts. Mm -hmm. And so that immediate post-operative period, it does feel like a pizza burn underneath the tongue. It truly mm -hmm. is uncomfortable. And so we have a lot of the times when you see, oh, phrenectomy didn't serve baby, you didn't get the outcomes you were seeking. And then you go, well, what was happening around it? That baby might not have been therapeutically prepared. And then there's um, post. Oh, yes. There, exactly. And post therapy is so much more feasible when you were already confident before the baby had the procedure. You need to be confident putting your fingers in your baby's mouth before they have a surgical procedure because you're not going to suddenly jump in the day of post and be able to help your baby lift their tongue. Right. And we're, yeah. if you have no idea what a phrenectomy is, you're probably hearing this lingo pizza burn surgical procedure and you're terrified and you're like, I'm turning this off. This is horrible. So can can Fair. you just briefly touch on Yes, thank that you. I so appreciate sound that. Sound complicated, but <laughs> what does it look like in real life? Like in office, out of office, how long does it take? Is it scissors? Is it laser? What in the world are we talking about? Perfect. Okay, let's let's open the lid off the black box. <laughs> okay. I know that everybody else may not know. So a tongue tie is when you have a little bit, it's not skin, it's mucosa but let's call it skin for the purpose of it's covering. It's like an outside surface. So it's a little bit of skin underneath your tongue. And when you lift it up, it's not stretchy. 
right? It has a limit to where it can stretch as opposed to other parts of our body, which if you stretch them and stretch them and stretch them, they will change shape. So it's something that will not modify with stretch. People always ask me, are you going to outgrow it? No, you don't outgrow it. It is the size it's going to be. Um, and so if this piece that is not stretchy prevents the tongue from doing basically what it's supposed to do. Your tongue should be able to stick out as you get older and be able to lick an ice cream cone. Your tongue should be able to suction up on the roof of your mouth. You should be able to make clicking sound, mm -hmm. right? And you should be able to open your mouth pretty wide when doing so. Your tongue should comfortably sit up on the roof of your mouth. And if this little band of tissue keeps the tongue down low, these are basic functions of the tongue that you're going to have to compensate for. Find some other way to do the things that it would do. In my office, the way I treat this in a newborn, in an infant, is we wrap them up in a swaddle. We use a little bit of numbing gel underneath the tongue. Numbing gel is a variable. Not all providers use numbing gel. Um, but again, coming from that academic environment, I know that pediatric pain is chronically underdiagnosed and underaddressed. Um, and so I feel that we are doing the right thing addressing it proactively so a little numbing gel it that is safe that, parents feel so much better i mean it like, certainly maybe helps me sleep at night <laughs> right um and look yeah. i would want the numbing gel okay for myself <laughs> want the numbing gel um and i do i you know there are some times when a child cannot have a numbing gel because of a family history and i i do notice the difference so i mm -hmm. i know i am helping a child be less distressed by using a little bit of numbing mm -hmm. um and then I, on infants, use a CO2 carbon dioxide laser, but I do not stand by there is one instrument one way. Okay. Because on older children, I use a scissor sometimes, okay. um, but it takes me 30 minutes on an older child. And I don't think that anybody wants an infant having a 30 minute procedure. So the, and, and as far as the laser, it is a way that I can very precisely touch and release that extra skin there. It lets me control bleeding. Um, it guarantees a very little amount of heat felt by the baby because it's a laser. And there are lasers out there that are very, very hot. And this one is not very, very hot. Um, and it's very fast. So it serves a lot of things that we need for babies specifically. So I, I really think that it's a great instrument for babies. Wonderful. Um, and when the procedure takes me, when the baby is stabilized, a minute or two. It's really brief. It's so brief. And then we pick baby up because I don't think any baby should be just like not comforted. You lay and... there and recover. We'll be back with you. Yeah, exactly. So you'll usually see me holding baby and I'm doing the mommy bounce, right? And the parents are like, they're really, they're, they're so chill. And I'm like, if I stop bouncing, <laughs> they're going to miss you. Here you go. Right. <laughs> um, and so... One thing that I notice in my practice is because I don't have those tied to the tip babies that are one week old, I'm typically seeing like a little bit older. I don't have babies going straight to latch after nursing most of the time. Um, and it's just something that I always tell families, I want to adjust expectations on this because this idea that this is hitting it out of the park, quick fix is just not fair to you. Um, so some babies will want to latch because they find that so comforting. And I always make a space for that and encourage the families to do so. But some babies are like, could you just hold me please? And I'm going to take a really long nap. And I encourage families like, let them take their nap. This nap is normal. This is what happens after you do something hard. And this, right. this was not, you know, and then they, they rest and then they wake up and they'll do their first feed. And I've so, heard parents say this makes a huge difference right away. Feeding, yeah. growth, oh, yeah. mood, fussiness. I, I think it's also fair to say, like you just said, every baby responds differently. And sometimes yes. the recovery feels a little harder. Sometimes they're more bothered by the, you know, post-procedure exercises. And they, it will still get you to that, you know, much better yep. place, but it may not be as magical or quick as that there. Right. Yeah. Okay. And I feel that seeing how a baby does pre like with their prehab therapy, you you get a good idea of who's going to snap in really quickly and who's going to need a whole lot of TLC. So you're also um, helping parents maybe set their expectations for their exactly. particular baby. And, and get the help that they need for it because yeah. I am not an advocate of DIY. It's just hard. Like nobody was born knowing how to lift this baby's tongue, teach the baby to suck. This isn't something very easy. And there are really skilled professionals in our community um, and so sometimes I, 
in the last year, I've had this interesting experience where I will get a parent who it's their second or third baby. And they're like, I know it's a tie. My first one was tied. We had it released. Um, and I will proceed with the release without saying, okay, we'll go do the, go see the therapist first. Cause they're like, I know how to do the exercises. They're, they're convinced. They're very confident. Yes. And what I do, this is something I do differently from a lot of providers, um, is I do a lot of post-oping and I do it to support a family because I don't want anybody struggling when I could have just helped. So I do a one day post-op. Well, okay. So the first post-op I do is the evening. I send a text and I'm like, how are you doing? And I just want them to have a warm line because that's the time. Usually at 3 a.m. you're like, I have a question. And I tell them like, if you send it at 3 a.m., I'm not going to see it, but I will see it first thing in the morning. But that warm line is where I get the short-term feedback of how baby feels. So most babies immediately post-op, they sleep, they take a good long nap, and their first feed, they're a little bit hungrier. And as long as they're on the Tylenol, they say they were a little fussy, but they're otherwise fine. And I feel really good knowing this information as opposed to wondering. So you can sleep. <laughs> yes, exactly. exactly. Um, then you get babies with the one day post-op and the one day post-op, I always say families, there's some wound care. You have to lift the tongue and you're going to do it approximately every four hours. And there's no strong science behind this every four hours. Okay. Every four hours I am saying is reflected on likelihood of adherence. Mm -hmm. So if I asked you to do it every two hours, you might actually have a little bit better of outcomes, but when will you sleep? Mm -hmm. Right. And your baby needs to sleep and you need to sleep. Whereas mm -hmm. every four hours follows a lot of everybody's wake windows mm -hmm. and it feels like I can ask it and also get it. And so that's a little bit of, of motivational interviewing and behavioral intervention. I want to do something that when you come back to me, you don't feel shame saying you couldn't do. Right. Right. right, right. So that's where my, that's why I say every four hours and right. it's a plus or minus. Like if they yeah. wake up at a three hour mark, you don't wait an hour <laughs> put them to sleep and wake them up like, okay, three hours is good. And right. if they're like, if you are in the middle of the night and you are out cold and your baby's out cold and it's a four hour mark, like hit the snooze for another 30 minutes and reevaluate it. And that's also okay. fine. Um, um, so I do that one day post-op and I say, I want you to do the wound care a couple times on your own without me watching and then come in and let me help you. Let me coach mm -hmm. you through a round. That way you do your flail on your own and you figure out what's hard and what you need help with. And then I can be meaningful help. Um, so I really do like doing that one day post-op. I will sometimes share it. So if somebody is coming from two hours away, and yes, I've definitely had some families come from two hours away and they have a local therapist that can help me with that. I'm going to do that because um, mm -hmm. I don't want people putting their babies in the car unnecessarily. Right. But I want you to have hands-on help one yeah. day post-op or two days post-op so that when you do something every four hours, you are confident you're doing it well. Right. And then I do a one week post-op and the one week post-op lets me ask how it changed things. And what I see is a good proportion of babies are having meaningful functional differences at the one week mark. Mm -hmm. And now I can adjust the wound care afterwards. I can take a picture. I can see what my own surgical outcomes look like. And I think that is very vulnerable, mm -hmm. right? I need to be very clear with my measurable outcomes. And by asking you, like, we're being clear on what really works and what yeah. doesn't. When I imagine, and, I mean, I don't imagine, I know if they're eating better, getting more, not having to oh, work yeah. so hard to do it, they are more pleasant, like calmer, not as fussy, oh my goodness. happier, um, Life and they can sleep better, assuming yes. that the sleep- Hungry babies don't sleep. Trying to get <laughs> right. Yeah, and, hungry and exhausted, babies- Exhausted, exhausted yeah. babies don't sleep particularly soundly, so I feel oh. like if they're expending just so much energy and effort on a process that should be fairly seamless, um, you know, we're all fussy when we're working too hard and not getting much yeah. from it. <laughs> Absolutely. And at that one week mark, I also now have enough time to say, do we need to adjust the help you have? Mm -hmm. um, because I don't want to discover that a month later. Right. Right? right. And that's what I found with those sprinkling of families with second babies with phrenectomies that were like, I got this. Right. And then I would see them at the postmark and I'd be like, you're 
you're doing it, you're doing the wound care, but you're not having the outcome I wanted you to have. Right. Right. And they didn't know that that was an end game. They were like, right. oh, well, this is how it ended with my first one. I'm like, there's more for you. Right. We can do better. Right. Right? right. And if you don't see them at that one week mark or, and, and these, I'm also a little unique. I'm not a tongue tie practice. I am a comprehensive pediatric dentistry practice. So I also get to see these babies at one year, two years. I see them progress over the years. Um, so I get I get a lot of good follow up. And this is data. This is it's good definitely. good info. All figured out. Um, so I want to shift a little. We've so far talked about yes. babies and feeding and tethered to shoes. Um, for what I do, I'm seeing a lot of two, three, four-year-olds and up who, you know, they're eating just fine. Maybe there was a tongue tie revised in the past. Maybe they spotted one and decided it wasn't disrupting feeding. So no need to do anything about it. Um, and now they are not sleeping particularly <gasps> well. And of course, in the threes, um, I think you can correct me on that, is also when things are growing and changing, tonsils, oh, yeah. adenoids <laughs> becoming enlarged. So if we're speaking about the older airway, I believe it's less about ties and more about the palate and other pieces of anatomy. So can you speak a little to preschoolers and their airway yes. and how, even if we can't see anything with our eyes, um, how can it affect their sleep? Yes. Oh my goodness. I That's like a love. whole nother one, right? <laughs> yes. Um, I will run away with this one. So you just keep me on okay. topic with it. <laughs> All right. So sleep is so essential. I think that we put all this energy into vitamins and nutrition. Um, and I, I don't think that we have enough value for how important sleep is for that developing brain and also what the variations in normal sleep look like. Um, but a preschooler who is showing signs that they're not getting enough sleep. So that might be a Especially child Especially if who, you can see that they are in terms of the right. number of Like they're in the bed, their right. eyes are closed, but they wake up, they're a super grumpy monkey yeah. most of the time. And they're having consistent and regular, if not constant meltdowns. They're just brittle. Their behavior is, yeah. Yes. Um, they look tired under their little say, eyes, that shiner, report, right? Yeah. Um, here's one. Sometimes, not a three-year-old, not a four-year-old, because it still falls within range of normal. But as children get a little bit older, they're still bedwetting, mm -hmm. right? And you go, you know, their dad was like this and their family, it's normal. But like they're seven and, and they're still struggling to make it through the night dry for one reason. Or they're not bedwetting, but they wake up two or three times a night to pee. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's just the other side of the same coin mm -hmm. where they're not concentrating urine. Mm -hmm. And as a result, having this problem, mm -hmm. um, if they're snoring, there is no such thing as a healthy child snoring. They might have a cold and then they're sick and then they're snoring. Right. But if they say are, that, say that one more time, really, there <laughs> is no such thing as a healthy child snoring. Thank you. I just wanted to soak in to everybody. Yeah. Now, if, if they're congested and this is, well, like they're sick, they have a cold. Bed, right. You're talking right? about all is well. This is just how they sound when they sleep. Right. Yes. Um, and this is a very personal story for me. This is child number two. My child, who is running, jumping, playing, lovely personality, turned into a meltdown kid, mm. turned into a morning grumpy monkey. And because I'm a data person, I realized that my three-year-old had not slept the night in nine months. <laughs> it's just like... I was like, how did I get to this being my normal that my child wakes up once to twice a night? And not that I expected her to be nighttime trained, but she was never waking up with a dry diaper. She was always waking up and often waking up soaking her diaper and needing to be changed. Mm -hmm. And when she would sit there in color, she would sound like Darth Vader. <laughs> But well, she wasn't. Which is different from snoring. We would. It was when she was awake. Mouth breathing. She was mouth breathing, but like 
you could hear it. Right. You could hear Noisy it. Noisy breathing. Mm-hmm. And when she would sleep, she would close her mouth, right? So it wasn't checking off this mouth breathing thing, but she had this low level grumble snore Mm -hmm. and it just wasn't checking anybody's alarm boxes, but mine. And so I tried to be patient. I tried to not be alarmist and I asked the experts and nobody was really checking off any boxes, but I was watching her grow. And she started being at rest with her mouth open at all times. She had a little bit of speech issues that I was able to prompt. And then you go back in time. She also was my difficult nurser. She never really thrived in that space. It was a heavy lift for me. And her arch started narrowing. She started becoming a child. So I have two children side by side. I have one who has like beautiful wide spaces between all of his teeth. And then my daughter, all of her spaces started closing. I was like, like, cathedral, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was like, wait a second. <laughs> you two are genetically the same people. What is happening here? Um, and then I, you know, did what I do as a parent and I'm feeling up in the roof of her mouth and she has a cathedral ceiling. My son does not. And finally, the stars aligned and being the child of a dentist, you don't get regular dental visits, right? You have to come in when you can like make it work. And I have her come in with my husband. I go, I need an x-ray on this child, on my three-year-old. <laughs> and I took a plain film of the side of her head. It's called a cephalometric radiograph. It's commonly taken in orthodontics. And my daughter had the largest adenoids mm-hmm. I have ever seen. And you could see them on that this. Film. I mean, you could see it from across the room. Mm-hmm. It was alarming. But she didn't sound the way every ENT or pediatrician would expect her to. She didn't look to them, but to me, she did. And this is where the power of a dentist in screening sleep disordered breathing comes in. And so take you a little bit back in time why I even started noticing this. In 2017, our professional organization threw out a very quiet guideline saying that all dentists should be able to screen for sleep disordered breathing. 2017, they're just like, here, start doing this thing with no training in the general profession. Sounds um, like a and- great idea. <laughs> Just a idea. I mean, I guess knowing is half the, like having a goal is half the battle. <laughs> right. Yep. Um, and so if you were paying attention, you started asking the questions of, is your child snoring? Are they grinding their teeth at night? Are they sleeping mm-hmm. the night? Are they bedwetting? Is your child on ADHD medication? right and these are questions that trigger more questions so a lot of people are very nervous about even stepping on this even Mm -hmm. starting this because you ask a question and then you get a yes answer well what do you do now so you refer that's -hmm. what they tell them to do you're supposed to refer refer to whom exactly the pediatrician perhaps an ENT perhaps a sleep center that has a one hour or one year wait list, perhaps. I mean, it's, it's terrifying. It's a black yes, hole. Those are our options here. Those are our part. options. Yeah. Um, so I said, okay, this is a big ask. I want to do well by my patients, but I, you can't just give me this list. So I just started, I started learning more. I'm reading and I'm taking well curated, continuing education on it. And I go, okay, all right. I understand the whys of each of these questions now. Mm-hmm. I am by no means a sleep physician, but I have better understanding of sleep architecture and where it fits in. I have better understanding of the neurotransmitters and the pathways that lead to grinding teeth being a mm-hmm. symptom. A better understanding of like when REM cycles kick in and what that does for childhood development when it looks like they're sleeping, but they don't stay in REM long enough. So it's and the quality then, that becomes compromised, which is why they could get the right quantity and still behave like they're very underslept and look Exactly. As they mm-hmm. And they might not grow because REM is when growth hormone is secreted and REM is when anti-diuretic hormone is secreted. And that's mm-hmm. why the bedwetting happens. Right. I was going to uh, ask you to tie that together for us. <laughs> yeah, you. no, like it, it, I needed answers because you can't ask me to screen for something and alarm families about it and then be like, but I don't know what to tell you to do about right. it. It's I just don't a even question know I have to ask, just, right? <laughs> just a question. Check, check, check. So I found that these were far more powerful questions now because I was like, okay, I see it. 
And then I had an important question from my colleague next door, who's a pediatrician. She goes, I hear you talking about these things a lot. What can we, I mean, are you, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> That's a really good point. So off to, You're like, I haven't gotten that far yet. <laughs> right, right. Off to more CE I go. And I am a part of the team. I, li- I like to describe it like I'm part of the pie. I am not the principal member of this pie, but I am a part of the team. And so for littles, my screening is similar to yours. It's making sure that there isn't an obstruction. Are allergies going untreated, for instance? And I think this is a a big big one one because philosophically, we came from a generation where the idea was less medicine is better, right? And I'm not really sure that I disagree with that. Less medicine, probably, like, you don't want to just throw a chemical on it, yeah, right? There's behavior things with that. There's keeping pets out of beds and taking care of dust and filters and things like that. But I live in the city. And this is a very (laughs) dusty, moldy, allergen infused space. And if I were to subscribe to the less is more philosophy, you end up with big tonsils and adenoids and inflamed mucosa of the nose and a child who just can't breathe through their nose. So one of the most helpful things that I think I do is I ask, has your pediatrician had any conversations with you about allergy control. And you know, actually what I found is most children have. And the families chose not to implement because they did not, it's called developing discrepancy in terms of saying, yes, I want to do an intervention or no, I do not. They didn't see enough benefit to their child to give them the medicine. They were like, oh, it's not that big a deal. I had allergies as a kid. My eyes were itchy. I moved on and I'm fine. And I go, okay, this is helpful. You already had somebody, a health provider who said it, and I am simply echoing their message with another why. And the why I can give you is a good dental why. And every single patient I see, I do a screener for sleep disordered breathing. And this is far more useful than asking you those sleep questions. I'm going to actually look at your child and show you the things that have been happening long term and are trending and are showing you this might be more of a chronic problem worth taking that allergy medicine that you were already told to do. And, you know, when I run through it, you know, are they breathing through their mouth? enough that when you look at them and I have TV screens in, in my office on the ceiling. So the kids are usually sitting in the chair looking up. (laughs) And if during the time I'm chatting with the parents, they're like, you're watching. (laughs) I'm like, have you noticed that your child breathes through their mouth most of the time? And it's easy for a parent to think that it's like a quirk or whatever, like, Oh, you know, all, but all those things that kids are doing, they're trying, like you said, to compensate. Yes. So the tilt up of the head and the open of the mouth and the, it's like, how can I maximize airflow because it yeah. isn't working the standard way. Exactly. And, and bringing attention to these variations, right? right? So are they mouth breathing? There's something called mentalis strain. It's overactivation of this muscle. So when we are struggling to move tongue, still tongue tie conversations, there's just, it's a degree of separation now. Um, we find other ways to close our mouth. And one mm-hmm. of them is using this muscle to pull the mm-hmm. lips up. So, mm-hmm. or it might look like lip sucking, lots mm-hmm. of kids lip suck. Um, so mentalis strain is one of them. It's a chronic compensation. Um, tonsil size. So if a kiddo opens up their mouth, you go, ah, and look all the way in the back of the throat. And those tonsils are greater than half of that throat space. They're enlarged. Mm-hmm. And this is a pretty common finding. Mm-hmm. Okay. But if they're so large that they're kissing, that means that as soon as they fall asleep, the muscles back here relax and this no longer tense open, but falls mm-hmm. back. Those kids have to be snoring. There's just right. nowhere for the air to pass through. But if you look in the back and they're snoring, and you don't see those tonsils, it can still be those adenoids. And this is a group that I found I was really helpful for because that x-ray I took on my daughter was really good at finding that and handing it to my colleagues, ear, nose, and throat physicians Mm -hmm. and saying, I can see these enlarged adenoids. You can use this information. Right. 
hand it right on over. Um, tongue tie matters. Oh, how are we still talking about tongue tie? <laughs> if you can't close your mouth and suction your tongue up on the roof of the mouth, it falls open most of the time. And if it's open most of the time, you are now irritating the living daylights out of your tonsils and that will contribute to inflaming them. You are also not growing the roof of your mouth, that bone there. That bone is not all genetic. That bone is grown by your tongue. And if the tongue is low, that bone stays narrow and will not and be you're not bit. filtering there's a whole filtration system built in through your nose huge breathing. filtration system like the air you breathe yeah. through your nose and the air you breathe through your mouth is totally different to your lungs yeah. it so is it's not like just a preference that our kids are mouth breathing and no. something we can be like okay that's you you do yeah. you. No, no no it is a completely different survival <laughs> mechanism and you know right. we use that air differently if it came through our nose than if it came through our mouth yeah okay. absolutely awesome. So tongue tie has that one. And then, you know, whether they grind their teeth or actually look narrow. If you look narrow, it means you've been breathing through your mouth so long that it changed your face. Changed the shape. Yeah. 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 So that's where dental comes in. And now yeah. I can be useful. And that's because... where I get a little skeptical when I hear a parent say, like, there was a tongue tie. It was spotted. It didn't affect feeding. Done. Right. And now they're coming to me with sleep challenges. I'm kind of like, I want someone to take a peek again because that's great that feeding went well, but that doesn't mean it's not causing a problem in a different area. And that person mm -hmm. is probably looking solely at how feeding was functioning because it was maybe too early to expect any kind of sleep norms or, you know, goals or right. anything like that. Well, I also find if we ask deeper questions, sometimes when they say it didn't affect feeding, the baby was gaining weight mm -hmm. and it didn't affect weight gain. But right. you look if you had looked at feeding, you would have seen a baby who is feeding and riding that letdown right. by feeding frequently. And mom's uncomfortable or in pain. Clicking. Or... That baby might have been on reflux medicine because they were gulping air and then refluxing it up. They might have been called the colicky baby because they were gassy all the time. Right. Um, or mom might have said, you know, we did breastfeed, but I stopped at three months and it was actually because their milk supply plummeted because the baby was so happy for three months. And then, you know, because they weren't latching right. effectively, the milk dried up. So they fed well is often um, something that I dance around carefully because I never want to distress mm -hmm. a parent. That's a memory right. time. Right. But sometimes there are the right questions you ask and you're like, oh, there were compensations. You made it work. You worked really hard at it, right. um, but they weren't feeding ideally you just right. made it happen right you're a super parent because you're a badass um so let me ask you this this sounds a little complicated definitely yeah. specialized so just to clarify it's not like every or is it is it every pediatric dentist can spot this ask those deep questions or are we if if our gut is pinging we're really looking for someone that's decided like you did i'm making this kind of part of my thing and I'm going to learn all there is to know. About yeah, it. that's a great okay. question. Um, I think the answer is going to be different today versus 10 years mm -hmm. um, because it's hard to teach a whole cohort of people how to do something. Right. And we only, human beings only change when we are moved to do so by some really good reason. So for me, I was moved to do so because I had so many questions about the children that I was taking care of. And I kept seeing them plateau in their development and their behavior and the things that they needed. So I had to get more information. But if you're super busy and you're not necessarily an infant focused practice, I don't know that you're going to go out and get educated in those things. And most doctors don't, you know, expand out of the things they touch on when they're in residency. Like if you don't know to go seek it, why would you go ask it? Right. But I do find residents who are in their training programs currently, they reach out to me all the time and they want to know. So in 10 and years, your answer is yeah, yeah, I do believe in 10 right. years, you're going to find it much easier to get this information. Um, so, but at the moment, a lot of the reasons that I went through and got the additional training I did was because I couldn't refer my babies to anybody. I couldn't right. refer my preschoolers to any, I, I had nowhere to send them. Right. And so. Which is not I, ever okay with any of us. <laughs> we, no. we, wanna, we want to, we need to get people where they need to be, or we need to become that resource. <laughs> yes. So I, I was very fortunate having as much orthodontic growth and development training as I did in my residency. It was significantly above typical. And I said, okay, 
I am going to find the best, the experts in the industry, and I am going to put all of my energy into learning this as much as I can. Um, so I am a part of that pie yeah. now, and I'm really grateful for that. And I think it helps parents to know, I mean, I know it sounds overwhelming, but you keep talking about the pie, and I would usually say a different version of that is like, this may require a multidisciplinary yes. approach, which parents are like, I want to go to one person. I want them to fix it. I want to be like done with it. And I totally get that. Right. But because this is so complicated and there's different lenses we need to look at it through, you really will probably need that sort of team. Yes. approach to get really the best result and make sure nothing's overlooked. And that doesn't have to be incredibly time consuming or scary. Um, and it doesn't have to be all at once. Right. Yes. Right. One person can look and then we can kind of move them down the, down the line. Um, what if a parent is told that there's not an issue or the issue does not need to be addressed, but their gut is telling them otherwise? What would you say to that parent? Well, I think anytime you have an opinion that doesn't settle your your curiosity or your gut instinct, get a second opinion. And it's just important that when you get a second opinion, it is uh, accessing something you did not previously have. Mm -hmm. So I don't want you to select a second opinion and give yourself like, it's called confirmation bias. I don't, mm -hmm. I'm not saying get a second opinion that's going to agree with you, but just make sure your second opinion has more knowledge. Mm -hmm. Right. right. Because if you ask your next door neighbor and you disagree with what they say and you just ask your other next door neighbor, but you're trying to decide if you're getting surgery, like, I don't know that those are an opinion and a second opinion. Right. It's right. good crowdsourcing. It's good to like sound off your ideas, but you just need to make sure that your opinions are building your knowledge base. Right. Um, and on my side, I do a lot of that for myself. There mm -hmm. are just times when I get asked a question and I go, I don't. I don't know, right. but I know where to get you this information. Right. Um, so awesome. just okay. expand your knowledge base when you get a second opinion. For sure. All right. We're officially at my, at my longest podcast so far. So congratulations. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Love it. Uh, but we will, we will bring it to a close here. I will definitely have you back for my last question. Take your dentist hat off all of yes. your other academic hats. I want only your mom hat on mom of two. Mm -hmm. eight years into that journey. Uh, what is one thing you've learned on your own parenting journey, hopefully that we didn't touch on yet, that yes. you wish you knew sooner, realized sooner, came to sooner, and you want other parents to know now? Yes. Okay. I have this memory of intro to solids with my son where I like so proudly pureed zucchini and his first food was vegetable. and. I thought I did it so well because I didn't do cereals like my mother said. And that when it came time to do intro to solids with my daughter, who is four years younger than my son, I take her to the pediatrician and I describe this. And she, she says to me, it's a little old fashioned. <laughs> <laughs> and so the thing that I wish I knew is that it is going to change. The correct answer is going to change and be okay with that. Um, because sometimes it worked for us and sometimes we find out that there was a better option and only by being really open-minded and listening, it's okay. It will change. Yeah. Um, and sometimes things change for the better. Sometimes we're not sure that that change is for the better, but like every generation, we are all absolutely adoring, loving of our babies. And so we are all motivated by that. So when we're changing, we're just trying to do better. Yeah. Um, so I think that just embracing the fact that we did not know everything before, and yeah. I do not know the right answer yet that's coming. Yeah. And when, when we know better, we can do better. Or yeah. when we know more, we can do differently. I love that so much. Dr. Maria, you are always a fabulous guest. I will Thank definitely you. have you on again. Thank you so much for joining me. Listeners, I'll be back soon with more stuff that I and other parents wish we had learned sooner. In the meantime, I'll leave you with my list of stuff I learned the hardest way. It's always the same. Accept help when it's offered. Ask for it when it isn't. You're the expert on your child, so trust your gut. And if you need to, be the squeaky wheel. Thank you so much, everybody. We'll be back soon. Thank you. 